So we are, first of all, welcome everyone to the School Garden Support Organization. Um, the first of our 2018 webinar series on selecting, installing, and managing school bed garden systems. My name is Stephanie Kitchler, and I work for a school garden support organization called Big Green. I also serve on the advisory committee of the National School Garden Network. Today, I'll be facilitating our webinar, and uh, let's get started. So first of all, just a little bit about the National School Garden Network. Um, we are a group of school garden professionals who met for the first time in 2012 at the Farm to Cafeteria Conference. We came up with the idea of creating a network, and now we're an advisory group called the National School Garden Network. And what we want to do is we want to create a space for dialogue, connectedness between organizations so we can all work together and facilitate conversations and elevate the work of each individual organization. So we do a couple of things together. Um, first and foremost, we have a forum on our website right here, nationalschoolgardennetwork.org. It is a Google group, and what you can do is you can either click on a topic, like right here, Garden to Cafeteria, or just above this, if you um, are on the website, there's actually a search function where you can type in something and search it. So um, we really recommend if you are, are at a school garden and you're at a school or if you're a school garden support organization, we encourage you to use this forum um, and see what resources already live and already exist on here. Great. Another thing we do, of course, since you're all here at our webinar, is we are excited to launch our 2018 webinar series. So today we have our first webinar. We'll also be having webinars in March, May, September and November. You guys will all be getting emails about these webinars as they come up. You can also look for them on our website, nationalschoolgardennetwork.org, where we'll have registration links and archives of all of our past webinars. So the third thing we do as a National School Garden Network is we host gatherings. And so the ninth annual National Farm to Cafeteria Conference is coming up, and we are so excited. This is hosted by the National Farm to School Network, and as of yesterday, early bird registration is open. So on April 26th in Cincinnati, we will be gathering. Um, Nathan Larson, who is an advisory member on the National School Garden Network, is organizing this. And so we're really excited and we're thankful to come together and talk and communicate at this wonderful national event. Perfect. So um, with no further ado, I want to jump into today's agenda. And um, we'll also be hearing a little bit about who's on today's webinar. So we have Tristana Perkle, she's with Whole Kids Foundation, and she's gonna quickly show us um, and give us a look at who's on today's webinar. Tristana? Hi everyone, can you hear me? Okay, I think you can, um, I'm assuming you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, yes, I'm with Whole Kids Foundation. Um, if you haven't checked out our opportunities for school garden support, grants, and resources, please do visit our website. Um, we're really excited to be helping to host these webinar series, so glad you all could join us. Um, so who's registered? Um, we had about 275 people register, which is super exciting, from the U.S. and Canada, 41 states, and two provinces. Together, we support about 7,000 school gardens. Um, we come from all different types of organizations, but as you can see, the majority of us are nonprofits, as well as school or district entities are kind of the second group of organizations. We've also got school, food service, philanthropic organizations, college, university, cooperative extensions, government organizations, coalitions, and then a small group of others. So a really fun group of people here today. Um, we're excited to show you what we've got. Awesome. Thanks, Tristana. We really do have a great network of professionals here today, and thank you all um, for being here and tuning in today with all of us. So in just a moment, I'm going to pass the mic over to our webinar host um, for the day, Sarah Pounders from Kids Gardening, who's going to give an overview of um, kind of our first agenda item, common school garden bed systems. We have some really, we have three really great case studies on deck for today, and so we will be hearing from those case studies. And so what I encourage everyone to do, um, and I see some of you have already found this function, on your dashboard for the webinar, if you have a question, please type it into the question box right there. Um, myself and Tristana will be able to monitor those questions. At the end of today, we will be going through a couple of the top questions that came in. 
um, or maybe reoccurring questions. And then our presenters will have a chance to answer those. We'll have a record of all your questions, whether we can answer them or not live. Um, we'll see. But we will follow up with any other questions or any lingering thoughts that are happening out there. Um, and we'll be actively trying to answer your questions if we can um, during the presentation as well by just responding back to you in the question box. So with no further ado, I'm going to pass this on over to Sarah Pounders. Sarah, you're on deck. Hi, and welcome. Um, the topic for today, selecting, installing, and managing school garden bed systems. I'm excited to bring it to you today. Um, I had suggested this topic mainly because I wanted to hear more about it for our own work. I work with Kids Gardening, a nonprofit that many of you may have heard of. Uh, we uh, were formerly part of the National Gardening Association, but we're now our own, our own nonprofit. And also today, we have Brady Keller from Texas A&M University AgriLife Extension, Adam Smick from Gardeners, Tim uh, Villard and Darren DeLay from Big Green. And so we'll just get started. Before, uh, we wanted to kick it off with a poll very quickly um, and kind of get an idea of what kind of garden bed systems are you currently using with your school garden program? So if you could answer that, that'll just kind of give us an idea who we're talking to, what you might already be using as we begin talking about um, some of the pros and cons. Um, the selections are in ground beds, raised beds, containers, a combination of all of them. And I guess I should say primarily each of those or uh, another other if selective, for instance, you're using hydroponic gardening or if you have um, maybe uh, grow lights, um, would probably fall into the other category. So I think that we are getting some responses on that one to see. Uh, Okay, here come the responses. It looks like we've got the largest majority is a combination of all of them. So we're, that's good, we'll touch on that, followed by raised beds and then in ground and containers and other. So excellent. So I think we'll, we'll definitely speak to all of those today. So I'm just gonna start off with a brief overview and I'm gonna try and go through it fast because I know the case studies are what you guys are really excited about learning about. Um, so we'll start off with just talking about why, why um, garden bed systems are so important. They're really the bones of your garden. Um, choosing the best system not only helps with the installation process, but it also can contribute significantly to your long-term success. And we see this a lot with the, the garden programs we work with, because if you if you lay a good foundation, then it's easier to pass on to the next person um, that comes along and to keep it maintained and keep everyone's excitement up. So the, um, we'll move on to just, just a few of the, touch on the benefits and challenges of each of these systems. So in-ground gardens, one of the benefits is obviously it can be a lower cost and it can be very flexible in size and shape. I've seen some really great gardens, very creative uh, pizza gardens that are shaped like a pizza and butterfly gardens that are shaped like a butterfly. Um, but they also come with a lot of challenges. First of all, most schools do not have good soil to start it out with, so you may need to have some amending. Um, it also can be a real challenge with weeds. Um, and as sustainability goes, a lot of times if, if it's in ground, it's um, fairly easy for um, for, it, for those weeds to get ahead of you and to everything to get mowed down by a, a landscape crew some summer when you got behind on weeding. So those are, and they're also, um, you need some, some kind of fencing usually to keep it protected. So the next bed, um, which is what most of you apparently are working with was raised bed gardens. There's a lot of benefits um, that you can bring in the best soil you can find. They're easy to cultivate and usually to keep weeded. This picture is one from the school garden that I work with, um, with my daughter's um, class. And we definitely, it keeps them out of the way of running feet and critters. Um, it's easy for drainage management and it's uh, um, just great if you have a surface that, it, that you can't already grow on. Um, some of the challenges, of course, are the cost of materials, um, that it's not easy to move, um, and you're somewhat limited in the shapes that you can um, usually provide. So the next final one is about container gardens. Container gardens, one of the benefits is that it's a really simple way to get started. Um, you can use it on any surface, surface, sorry, any surface. It's generally can be, you can do it at a low cost. It's easy to move. Some of the challenges are keeping it watered. Um, and obviously it kind of limits the amount of plants that you can choose from for growing. So um, just moving along, I know that everyone kind of, um, knows that there's a number of factors that you consider when you look behind this. There's not, there's no, that what we're gonna present today, there's no one perfect bed system. There's no one perfect, um, you know, raised bed for, it's based on your site and who's gonna be gardening. The cost 
it's the price um, of what you have available, the ease of installation. Obviously, your maintenance is very important to consider, and um, irrigation considerations is a huge thing for sustainability and how long they'll last. So we'll just kind of what all of these factors kind of multiply because a lot of the folks that are on the call today are with school garden support organizations. And so you have, are addressing all of these things for so many different schools. So you have really two options. You can either choose to do a standardized system with all the schools you work with, or you can choose to do a unique bed system with each school where you go in and you um, try and, uh, and, and pick what, what works best for the school. So we'll look at next um, some of the pros and cons of each, and then the case studies are gonna provide you with some examples um, of both. So we have two examples of standardized, standardized bed systems, where the benefit can be if you have a standardized system, it's easy to explain your program to different stakeholders and schools. You obviously have the benefit of buying in bulk, which can save you money, um, and you can simplify your training and installation and maintenance. It also comes with some challenges because you have to find a system that will work with diverse schools and populations and programs. And you also wanna make sure that you're maintaining the school's sense of ownership. Um, because even though we talk about not wanting to reinvent the wheel, um, inventing, inventing your own wheel can be very exciting. So we wanna make sure everyone still is motivated um, as you're using your bed systems. So unique bed systems, some of the benefits are is you have a, uh, might have a more flexible use of your space. You can really adapt with different budgets and use what's available. Um, there's the excitement of the planning process as everybody's looking at doing something new. And then the challenges may be that maintenance will vary and you may need to do some different training. Um, and also you may have to source all of your supplies, not only the supplies to um, install the systems, but also the, the supplies to build depending on what you're we're using. So we're going to jump right into the case studies. We're going to have two case studies from folks who use standardized systems and one from who's going to give us an example of using a unique bed systems with each school. So we're going to start with Brandy Keller and we'll hand it over to you, Brandy. Hi, um, I'm Brandy Keller. I'm with the Harris County AgriLife Extension and I'm the Master Gardener Program Coordinator. So I work between the extension with the Master Gardeners who are volunteers uh, for the extension. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the cylinder gardening program today. Uh, the history is that it started in 1986. Uh, it was started by the Harris County Master Gardeners, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, and the Men's Garden Club of Houston. Um, the need arose to demonstrate that small successful gardens can be grown without the maintenance of a full garden. Uh, right now, Harris County has four and a half million people, so that population is very diverse. With and the properties are, are diverse. Uh, some people have very, very little um, space to actually plant gardens. The mission is to provide teachers with tools to instruct children how to grow vegetables from seed to harvest in one semester, and that's really important because it. It, it allows those children that entire uh, plant life cycle. Um, so it's teaching them different aspects of science, the environment. And one of the best rewards uh, that I've heard is just seeing that pride of the children growing the, uh, the plants from seed all the way to the food that they're gonna eat. So our audience is mainly teachers, and that can be more traditional classrooms, after-school programs, homeschools. It could be really any kind of club. Um, it just depends who registers. Uh, with our cylinder gardening program, uh, register, registration is done twice a year in the spring or fall. And with that, we supply the seeds, the fertilizer, cylinders, and and instructions. Um, then, and so within between the registration and when we close the res, um, registration, there's about three weeks to get all that together, and then we'll either mail the supplies if, the, if it's just seeds, or we provide a pickup uh, for the cylinders. One of the other programs that the extension works with is the uh, JMG LG. EG programs. So the cylinder gardening program can be used as a standalone 
or it can be integrated in with the Learn, Grow, Eat, Go program. And that is a little bit different because it actually has curriculum. It can um, teach, it teaches youth where the food comes from. It provides uh, new food exposure. Uh, some of these children don't, haven't even seen a radish. Um, I've talked to one that never even uh, saw an onion. So it supports increasing the consumption of fresh produce. Uh, the, our bed system obviously is mainly containers. Uh, the cylinders are really a hybrid between a container and a raised bed, uh, but you can use any kind of cylinder pots uh, for small spaces, patios, even uh, people who rent that don't, don't have the ability to uh, put in a large garden. The materials we provide are the, um, now the materials are provided between the extension and the master gardeners. Uh, there's a lot of donation that goes on here. The seeds and the fertilizer, and then we use four or five gallon buckets. We cut those in half and then we cut the bottom off. So what we're left with are two cylinders that are about eight inches tall. And then the schools are responsible for the potting soil. The potting soil is the main one. Uh, it is optional if they want to provide cover in the fall to protect from the heat or winds in the spring. And then, of course, there might be mulch involved. The location of um, the location you choose for the beds uh, is really flexible. It can be existing or mulched beds, grass, concrete, as long as it really has uh, at least six hours a day of sun and you need a proximity to a water source. I think the water is probably the biggest limiting factor because we don't want to see the kids uh, going over a huge field with uh, big, big barrels of water. The setup uh, is fairly easy. You just want to clear the area and create a border. The photos on the right show a cylinder gardening. Um, it's a test garden at the extension. So you would place the cylinders 18 to 24 inches apart and you can see the newspaper underneath in the bottom photo. Uh, so that's going to create some kind of barrier between the ground and the potting soil. So you can use newspapers or bags. And the top photo shows uh, once the mulch is down, so it looks a little bit more like a traditional garden. Um, so the planting is going to involve adding the soil, the fertilizer, the seeds. Uh, and there's a graphic a little bit later on that'll show you the napkin. So the student involvement is they would glue the seeds onto a napkin. And that really depends on what type of plant it is. Uh, with how many seeds go on that napkin. For example, a tomato may get glued right in smack dab in the center of a napkin and there's only one seed. And radishes, there will be about a total of nine. So once those are dried, they plant the napkin, add the soil, water, and then I think labeling uh, is a cool part because then there'd be a little bit of creativity. And once everything is set up, the maintenance is pretty uh, low. The first two weeks, they do want to water every day. Um, but once that is established, the watering is a little less. And of course, you, wanna wa you don't want to water if it's rained. Uh, you want to uh, determine your watering needs based on that. Uh, there's minimal weeding. And then, of course, the fun part is the harvesting. The seeds that we hand out, they'll mature anywhere from 30 to 90 days. And the photo on the bottom left shows a school garden. You can see that they've put pavers in so the children can, you know, has, have a surface to walk across to access that center row. And on the right side, that is a, that's at the extension and it's raised to about three feet. So they don't have to bend over at all. Next. And here is the 
life cycle of a radish. So on the upper left, you can see that there's a circular, um, a circle cut out of a napkin. The kids glue the seeds, uh, the planting, and then the progression of the growth. And for Harris County, uh, these are the numbers that we have for the last four years. So over the last four years, we've uh, served 35,000 children. The numbers in the red are we have encountered a few pretty major floods. So in the fall of 2015, uh, those numbers went down, but it's pretty amazing in the fall of two, 2017, uh, Hurricane Harvey, the cylinder seasoning went um, went on as scheduled. So those are pretty good numbers uh, based on all the destruction that we went through. Next. The benefits uh, are low cost and obviously the garden preparation. So the master gardeners spend about $200 a semester for seeds, baggies, and po uh, postage. And then for the schools, it would just be the cost of the soil. Uh, another obvious benefit would be the garden preparation. It's little space, low maintenance, uh, very little garden prep. And it works with poor, poor soil basically because we don't use the soil at all. Uh, the care is, for the plant is more personalized. So two students per pot, uh, they take more of an ownership with those plants. And then the watering is more localized too. All the water that gets put in the bucket is somehow gonna reach those plant roots compared to a traditional bed. And then it is portable. Uh, it's easily removed and reused. And the, I think this is the last slide. So the challenges would be for the schools, it's teacher commitment. For example, uh, when, you know, if there's spring break, are the teachers uh, planning on watering uh, while they're gone? And even though it is low maintenance, that is another challenge for some of the schools is just doing the basic maintenance. For the Harris County Master Gardener, uh, we've, have a challenge finding and keeping mentors. Uh, right now we do not have a mentor program, but they were assigned to teachers if they had questions or uh, problems with their gardens. And then also the other challenge is that we don't have a way to gather information on the success of um, all the school's gardens. So that is all I have, uh, thank you. And I'm gonna pass it off to Adam. Hey, hey, thank you, everybody. And um, just um, just as a kind of forward note, I am um, I do have the flu over here, so please bear with me. Um, but yeah, my name is Adam Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of Gardeners. We are a four-year-old nonprofit based in Chicago, um, and we do school garden support, uh, school garden programming. So we work with 24 schools across the city of Chicago, um, and we will work with 1,800 students this, um, this year. How it works is that we have a team of two garden educators that go to the school on a weekly basis. We bring kids out into the garden where we do lessons on nutrition, community, and nature with them. So we teach students about um, how to eat healthy. Uh, I know Brandy spoke a little bit about, um, you know, some of the students hadn't seen or um, didn't know what a lot of uh, fresh produce looked like. So um, and there's a lot of research showing that uh, by growing it themselves, students are more likely to try it and continue eating it throughout the rest of their life. Um, we do... Um, and we also have the students learn about, um, oh, go back, please, um, issues that are facing the, uh, the environment and what they can do about it on a local level, um, and also issue, uh, things like social emotional skills and community building. So each school um, is very different looking. We don't have like kind of a standardized um, plan for any of the schools. A lot of the schools that we uh, were invited to work with actually had had a garden space existing before we went there. Um, and so we just kind of re -bring, uh, revitalized and bring it back to life. Um, I would say that our kind of bread and butter is a four by eight untreated wood uh, raised bed. So that's what we do most often. Um, one of the greatest things about it is it's very easy, it's low cost. Um, so if we buy, um, I mean, if you see the, the square kind of in the upper right hand corner or either the top two there, um, those probably cost 50 bucks to, to put together. Um, you can get a two by 12 untreated. Uh, you get three of them, you cut one in half, so it's the short ends. Um, and you put the other two on the sides. Um, and I usually put like a two by four in the, in the, the picture up in the kind of, in the upper left 
is a four by four, but you need about 16 screws. You can put it together in, um, we'll call it 20 minutes. Um, and then you just have to fill it with soil. And we think that, um, you know, certainly the, um, the garden space is very important, but we, we definitely, uh, kind of one of our um, mottos or one of our things we go by is thinking that Soil is much more important than the the container that it's in. So we we actually do use um, structures that like like Brandy talked about before, where we actually have I don't have them pictured here, but we do and I have like uh, little dug in planters um, that we use that have open bottoms that we put into the garden, um, and we actually use big uh, some big green setups as well. Um, so um, you'll see there on the um, so the top two are the raised bed systems. It's just again, you fill, make a square, set it down. You put. Uh, we use cardboard. You could use newspaper. You could use pretty much anything to just create a barrier from the the grass that's underneath it. Uh, you fill it up with some good soil, um, and then you can start planting it pretty immediately. Um, on the bottom right, you'll see that we use uh, tower garden projects. Um, we use the, their tower gardens. We have those in I think three or four of our schools. Um, in the bottom middle, you see that we actually have um, raised. We um, have um, hoop houses at two of our sites um, and actually one of my, uh, kind of most creative and most fun the one that i'm kind of most interested in um, is if you see in the bottom left um, all we did there is what we did is we, we got a bunch of stumps donated to us and we dug into the ground and we just kind of buried the stumps maybe three or four inches into the ground and put them all close enough together so that they were packed next to each other um, and then we just filled those with soil um, and that it made, it had a really cool look and it was actually, I mean, the only cost we had was the soil because um, the guy dropped off um, stumps for us. So that was a really cool thing um, and the stumps actually will absorb a little bit of water um, and help uh, maintain uh, uh, hum uh, moisture for the plants. So that was a really fun um, activity putting it together. Now, one of the challenges for these systems that they, they do, uh, they're, they're different. So each of them has um, variable repair needs, so uh, you do need to kind of know, you know, we, we are at these sites once a week, so we can say, oh, hey, this, this raised bed, you know, this piece of wood is coming off, um, hey, can you come over here and uh, help us screw on another piece of wood, so we go do that every so often, um, and that happens differently. We find that even if you've made the exact same bed in two different spots, or in, in exact, you know, two four by eights right next to each other, one might start breaking down earlier than the other. And that could be from just, you know, getting a little bit more sun, a little bit more moisture or whatever, um, or the kids stepping out a little more than the other. Um, so, you know, that happens. Um, and it does help, you know, that we have people on staff that have a little bit of, um, you know, can do some basic carpentry and put stuff together. Um, some of the, the benefits, again, is super low cost. So um, a four by eight by, tw uh, a four by eight piece of wood, uh, um, or sorry, a, a, um, a two by 12 that's eight foot long is like 13 bucks. So if we get three of those, that's 39 bucks. And then we buy our soil in bulk or our com uh, soil and compost in bulk. So we can get that for about 10 bucks also. Uh, Cause that's about, it ends up being about a yard. Four by eight by one is about 24 cubic feet. Uh, and a cubic yard of soil is 27 cubic feet. So um, it's a little bit less than a cubic yard. Um, so, I mean, we, we also use um, natural um, or organic fertilizers like worm castings um so that'll end up being you know but we also get a good deal on that so we get those like a bag of that for like three dollars um and that's very helpful for again we, we say that the soil is so much more important than the container that it's in um as um, brandy said before that the raised beds have less weeds than just in-ground beds um and they're easier to keep watered because they do have the connection to um the one um the roots can get kind of into the water table so they can um they're able to get the water when you if you haven't watered it over the summer um as would happen in the container garden um the other great thing is it's easy to expand so we've had schools that hey we had you know they had uh you know they started with a smaller garden and then we've expanded there and they want to have bring more students out there and get more of the school involved and in order to do that we need more space so it's just it's easier to make new ones um, just you know if the space fits it you just screw together a few more of those we have a little community day where everyone comes out and puts them together um, and it's very easy to add um, those things. Um, and if we can move to the next slide. Oh, I think that's it. So I'll hand this off to Darren and Tim.
All right. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name is Tim speaking right now and Darren and I will be sharing about working with standardized garden systems on a large scale. Uh, so to begin with introductions, my name is Tim Villard. I work in our national office in Boulder, Colorado as the national garden manager for our program team. I'm Darren DeLay. I'm our project management director and I also work out of the home office here in Boulder, Colorado. Okay, so first I want to introduce you to our organization, Big Green. For, oh, thanks guys. For six and a half years, we call ourselves the kitchen community, uh, teaching school gardening and connecting school kids to growing real food. This year we have rebranded as Big Green. So why did we rename ourselves from the kitchen community to Big Green? Uh, it really has to do with our growth goals. Next slide, perfect. Uh, so in 2017, we outlined an ambitious growth plan to expand to a total of 10 cities in the next four years with a goal of installing 1,000 learning gardens in schools by the end of 2020. To date, we have installed 435 gardens in six cities, and we are excited to announce we are opening in Detroit this spring, which will be our seventh city. So amidst the rebrand, uh, it's important to note that if you worked with us before, or if you work with us in your learning garden now, you can expect that our services and our relationship with you are still the same. At Big Green, we are committed to improving the health of underserved children around the country. We start with our learning gardens and we aim to increase the food literacy of our school communities and provide a platform from which schools can work to positively impact their school food environment. I think everyone listening is well aware that many of the issues facing our society are large and systemic preventable and chronic diet related diseases and an inequitable food system are two linked systemic issues which disproportionately impact underserved communities and children in particular are highly impacted because these problems are so big they need to be tackled on a really large scale so we're really excited to move forward as big green which is a name that can scale up with us and that reflects our goal to answer the need for change on a big scale from the ground up Okay, moving past the introduction, uh, we need to share a quick overview of how we work with schools and how schools then work with their gardens. In each city where we work, we have a local team who installs the gardens and then works with each school to help them be successful. When we install a garden at a school, the school needs to have already assembled a committed group from within the school or their community who will volunteer to manage that garden. We call this group the garden team and we recommend it as a team of four with broader support and participation from the school staff and administration, students and families. Garden teams organize differently at each school because they are a reflection of that school's unique culture and community. Uh, garden teams oversee and implement the care of their garden that their gardens require and they are the real drivers of engagement and impact at their school. So you can quickly see the importance of sustaining this team over time. Each school we work with is assigned a garden educator, a staff member of Big Green, who will work with that school's garden team each year. Almost all of our garden design tools and resources are created to help the garden team and participating teachers use the space with as few barriers as possible. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so as we discussed selecting, installing, and managing school garden bed systems, uh, I think it's important to remember that the school gardens are also spaces of opportunity uh, and the natural inclination of kids to move, play, and explore. And our learning garden design tries to leverage those inclinations and those opportunities. Our beds are made using a high-density polyethylene and a linear low-density polyethylene product through a process called rotational molding. Our beds are rotationally molded in Los Angeles, California. In that process, pellets are poured into a steel mold, placed into an oven, spun, and then before being cooled, creating a final, our final bed product. The pellets are a food grade plastic that don't leach and are FDA approved. We have three different uh, bed types and sizes shown here, and we typically use four of each type in an elementary and middle school garden for a total of 12 beds in that garden system. In our high school garden, uh, in our high school learning gardens, we use 16 of our seabeds, the largest bed. The high school design allows for food production at a larger scale within our Real Food Lab program. 
as well as incorporates an area designated as a classroom environment. The curved beds are designed to accommodate low capacity of the outward force of soil pushing against the bed. Uh, the beds are designed to withhold a load of 50 pounds per square inch. The beds are also designed to allow for water to drain through the bottom to help with prevent gardening issues such as root rot. The beds have a warranty and are expected to have a life cycle of 25 plus years. We'll talk a little bit about our process. Uh, applications are received through an online application and then are reviewed by our project and program managers within each region where the application resonated. A thorough site analysis is given to each school that applies to vet the requested location or determine some appropriate alternatives that may be better suited in thinking about factors such as sunlight, uh, a viable water source, student staff, staff circulation and access, exposure to the various elements. Once we agree on that location, we complete a site review and sign off and award the school a learning garden. That's a key designation there is that we award them the garden. After we agree upon the location, our project managers are able then to design within that space and develop the actual scope of the garden. We review and design each learning garden with the principal, the school gardens team, uh, the, the garden team lead, and the district facilities and operations department at our kickoff meeting. At that meeting, we sign off on what's called a learning garden agreement which essentially coordinates what the final design will look like, the scope of work, the schedule of construction, and when our kickoff day is, uh, which occurs with the students for installation of the soil, uh, seeds, and seedlings, building on a sense of ownership for their garden. Our program team continues that support to support the schools and their garden teams, and our project management team supports schools and districts for an ongoing maintenance needs and products that may occur. Uh, talk a little bit about this design. By the way, just as a note, all the photos that you see are associated with it, that, that particular design uh, shown on this page. So in designing, in designing the learning garden, we use core principles of universal design and access to help inform many of our own decisions in the design. The designs are created by our team of project managers who are trained as landscape architects or have background in similar design field, fields. The modular nature of the beds allow for multiple layouts and design sequences within the footprint of the garden types, being the elementary school, middle school, and high school that I discussed earlier. The form giving of those bed sequences allow for ease of flow and circulation and access throughout the garden. The infrastructure, what we refer to as hardscape, is ADA accessible so that students with disabilities may still access the garden and engage with their peers in the garden. A licensed and district approved contractor builds out the garden infrastructure as well as our product line uh, which includes the bed. So all of that infrastructure is placed by them, installed by them uh, for the school and the students. Turn that back over to Tim now. Awesome. So um, I know that Adam mentioned the importance of soils just a minute ago. Um, soils need annual attention, as we all know. Even though our gardens are really large for containers, uh, we still fill our gardens with potting mixes that are rich in amendments and compost. Growing in a potting mix in a container garden is great for beginner and advanced gardeners for several reasons. Your soil will contain no weeds in your first year and no weeds will enter your garden by way of horizontal roots, traveling underground or things like that. It's also really lightweight, easy to work with and easy for kids to get their hands into. Uh, potting mixes are different than native soils, but when it comes down to it, they're surprisingly similar to work with and teach in. Um, in any container garden, you should expect to add at least the same amount of compost or other soil amendments that you would when growing in the ground, uh, if not, oftentimes a little more. We also find that many of our gardens need soil top-offs every few years because with a soil mix that is primarily organic matter, it will inevitably decompose over time and it needs to be uh, topped off. And watering is our final topic. So to set our schools up for success with watering, we install our gardens as close to a good water source as we can, and we provide and train garden teams on several watering options and tools to use when watering the garden. Each garden has an irrigation system, a hose and spray nozzle, and several suggested tools and techniques for, techniques for watering with classrooms. When garden teams plan to use their garden, creating a watering schedule is usually the first hurdle and is often one of the largest. By providing several watering options and the training for each tool, garden teams can focus their attention on recruiting and training volunteers and coordinating their watering schedule. 
Uh, you can find some of the resources we use to help garden teams manage a watering schedule on our website as well. One thing I'll add is that hoses are also notoriously challenging to work with, so we have figured out two ways we make working with hoses easier. Uh, we set up a system with shorter hoses, as, as short as we can get them to be. Um, a close water source is key for this. We also attach quick connectors at both ends of every hose. This way, nobody has to deal with hose threading, and the setup and breakdown for watering is really quick. Um, providing several options for watering is a little costly, but we view it as money well spent. Uh, since watering is the most frequent task in a school garden, it has to be made as easy as possible for everyone. So like Adam and Brandy and Sarah have discussed prior to us, there, there are lots of similar challenges and benefits, I think, across all of these systems. Uh, so uh, going over the benefits, I think the modular nature of our, of our system uh, makes it adaptable to fit on any schoolyard. Uh, and there's some portability to the actual product when the beds are empty. Uh, they're about 50 pounds each uh, filled with soil. That's not the case. So um, when I talk about portability, it's a little bit different than mobility. Uh, another advantage is the product warranty of the 25 plus year life cycle of this product. Um, it meets the, the product meets universal design ADA codes for a height and reach. Uh, I will note that that uh, the width of the bed is 30 inches. ADA code is 24 inches across. So we need to provide access on both sides for that. Uh, to meet that code. Uh, another benefit is a container planting system avoids contact with potentially contaminated soil, soil and, and surface in some of our regions. Um, challenges, uh, it's container gardening <laughs> uh, for one. Uh, another challenge is that uh, it's not a retail model. Um, our schools, our, our gardens aren't available uh, for purchase. Schools don't need to purchase them. They're awarded uh, through a garden. And I'll, I'll discuss kind of how that works with uh, fundraising challenge a little bit further down. Uh, success in gardening also depends on the success of a garden team at each school. School communities inevitably change over time. Uh, our program model is to work with garden teams at each school, so successful engagement relies heavily on that garden team and our cooperation and collaboration with them. We view this as an asset to work with and train the leaders within each school to champion the garden, but the challenge is always, uh, can be very energy intensive uh, because, as I said, school community change over time. Uh, there's teacher, student, and family turnover. Uh, so schools need to continually recruit and build their garden team within to, to help us find that continued success. Uh, and as I said, uh, we're Big Green is, is a nonprofit. We fundraise for all of our products, our installation, and our programming support. And there are inherent challenges associated with fundraising and development in general uh, with being a nonprofit. All right, thanks guys. Awesome. So we're going to pass it back over to Tristana. She has been taking a look at everyone's questions and has hopefully categorized them a little bit. We have about 10 minutes to go over some key questions. And so with that, um, Tristana. Hi, everyone. I am going to ask you all some questions. Our panelists some questions from just working to unmute everyone. Um, the first question is for Brandy. Could you kind of share a little bit more information about the, gar the cylinders that you, you plant in? Um, kind of go over why you use them. You know, is it to reduce weeding? weeding? Um, do you use different sizes depending on plant type? Um, how long do the buckets last? And can they be reused? Kind of an overview of all of the, the, the cylinders that you garden in. Yeah, um, there really is not a variability in the uh, bucket size, mainly because we have thousands of buckets donated. And um, the four, we've discovered the four to five gallon buckets uh, provide enough space for the roots with the soil. Um, so we just primarily use those two sizes. Um, as far one of the one of the advantages of the cylinder gardening is the reusability of the buckets. So at the end of the season, you can you know lift up the cylinder, spread out the soil, you know store it for the winter, and and then reuse it if you'd like. Uh, because it's a really thick, hard bucket, uh, they last for a long time. But again, that's going to depend on whether you leave them out in the elements and what kind of elements you have where you are. But typically, they last for years. Um, was there another question with that? 
Um, let's see. I oh, think you got it. well, and like I, I see it says something about to reduce weeding. Is that why we use the cylinders? The, the cylinders are used more. I mean, the weeding is uh, is an advantage. It's something that, you know, just kind of works out for us. But the cylinders are used mainly because of flexibility. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be an established bed. You know, with an with a with a regular garden, you're going to have to go in and amend the soil, and there's a lot of physical labor when it comes to that sometimes. Um, so this reduces amending soil. You're just going to put the potting soil directly in, so you have 100% control of the soil that those plants are being um, grown in. And then also flexibility. Uh, maybe some schools don't have as much space. They can uh, put the cylinders right directly on concrete. Uh, so it's just really the portability the and the flexibility and the ease. Awesome, thank you. Um, Adam, could you speak to the lifespan on the garden beds you use? You know, what, what kind of wood are you using? How long do they last? So we've been in operation for four years now. Um, we've never seen any of the ones that we have built come apart. So I don't know. Um, I've not seen any of the ones, like I said, um, at least four years for everything so far. Um, my guess is it's somewhere around 10, five, 10 years, um, or well, probably more than that, probably more like 10, because none of the ones we've built together are falling apart at, our, at all. We have, where we have kind of jumped in and taken over, um, you know, we, we went to a school where there had been a garden started, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and we've had to go repair theirs. Um, so that we've had to do. Um, but at least, I mean, so, so far, at least four years for sure, um, without really any kind of signs of wear and tear. My guess is 10. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the folks at the Big Green, what is the approximate cost for the 16 bed high school or the 12 bed primary school? Um, is there a modular cost? Um, you know, for each of the beds or group of beds, that would be great to hear. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to that a little bit. This is Darren. Um, again, we don't have a retail model, so our, uh, one of the major challenges is this is not for sale. Uh, what goes into the, the cost and the value of, of a garden is all of our product uh, beyond the beds. Uh, all of that has a cost of fabrication associated with manufacturing. The contractor is a paid cost. Uh, that we outsource, as well as our time uh, to provide the programming, the curriculum, uh, the workshop support, uh, and then the design and construction management. So nailing that number down is is a, is is a it's it's a it's a part of a larger system, I guess is is easiest way to sort of answer that. And just to to kind of elaborate on that as well, um, one of the key parts of our program and our product is that um, the schools themselves don't pay for it. Um, so we, we fundraise separately, uh, but all these products, the installation and the program uh, is, a, is installed at no cost to the schools. Great, thank you. So here's a question for all the panelists. Um, there was a challenge mentioned of not being able, of not measuring of success. Um, what would the various panelists quantify as a successful garden implementation? I, I, this is Darren from Big Green again. Uh, in a conversation with the school district we had this morning with Detroit and uh, assist a, a program that they've already started and had going a lot from the ground up for many years. And they hold that very near and dear and close to their heart as the champions of that. And, and what would a partnership with us look like? And the, the biggest thing we talked about was sort of permanence, semi-permanence and and what the gardens look like uh, in terms of infrastructure and the ongoing support. And they they found that they sort of lose some steam uh, with uh, the changing of the of the guard in some of the schools, so to speak, and and the infrastructure maybe not getting the the, the garden getting the love and care that they need. So for us, success is the sustainability uh, and ongoing success of the garden itself uh, being used, uh, being maintained, uh, whatever, however that school sees fit, and whatever the the leaders and champions at that school. Uh, find uh, to merit, um, you know, connections to their kids at, at, at another level beyond the interior classroom, uh, the chalkboard, the laptop, the notebook. So that's success.
for us as well, I think. And this Great, is Sarah. Thank you. Any of the others? Go ahead, yeah. This is Sarah from Kids Gardening. I was also thinking the same idea is that um, the program being sustained over a long period of time to us is something we look for as far as being a successful program because it shows the, the investment of, of um, both the, the whole community in it and also just the flexibility of the program too. I think that's a it's a good sign that um, the design um, was able to be used by multiple people and, and they could um, you know, still see their own vision in it and take off and run with the basic foundation that was originally laid. So, and they still feel, I think everyone has to come through and, and make it their own in a different way every year um, to keep the excitement up. Yeah, um, at our end, we, we measure the number of students that participate um, either every week or every other week. Um, and then we measure also the total pounds of food grown every year as well as the number of volunteers um, that are that participate in the garden at the various events that we that we host. So those are some of our um, our metrics. We also take metrics of the school leaders to um, asking them uh, kind of a series of survey questions, um, asking them you know whether they think that the how the garden has benefited the school. Um, so we look at the, those survey results also. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, Brandy, back to you. Could you explain the glue that you're that you're using in the the cylinder garden beds? Um, what kind you're using so that the seeds don't mind, and and how how is the glue attached? Um, it's really just kind of regular glue, like an Elmer's glue. Uh, I think the biggest challenge there is with kids. Uh, I've worked with um, second, and third, fourth graders, and it's impossible possible to get them to use a tiny drop of glue. Uh, so that's probably the, the biggest challenge. But yeah, you, you know, you just use something like that. Even with the glue, um, when I first started and I asked about the glue and the seed, evidently there's really no issue with that seed germinating. If the if it does get a little encapsulated with the glue, it, it, still, it still works. Um, but some seeds are bigger, like a squash seed would, you know, that would be easier to glue. And then broccoli seeds are super tiny. So those might need more supervision. Great, thank you. And could you share a little bit more about the Learn, Grow, Eat, Go curriculum? Um, is it geared for a particular age group? Are teachers using it or is it being taught by master gardeners? Um, and is it tied to the raised beds or any particular bed system? Um, so the Learn, Grow, Eat, Go is part of GMG, which is a junior master gardening program, and that is technically under 4-H, where the master gardeners are under um, horticulture. So we do have master gardeners come in and help out with the um, LGEG, but the, the training is actually uh, set up by the agent, um, the 4-H youth education agent. And there is a training numerous times a year, at least in Harris County around Houston, there is uh, where teachers will get the booklet, they'll go through the curriculum, they'll even learn some recipes to use uh, with the foods that they're growing. Mm -hmm. um, the big difference with the LGEG in the cylinder gardening program is the LGEG uses a cylinder gardening program, but it's it's an entire curriculum. And um, again, in Harris County, at least, I can't speak for other counties, there is support by that agent then. So, you know, there, there's a, and there's, there's testing with the kids before and after to test their knowledge. So there's a lot more control in um, measuring the success, but also helping the teachers along with the process. I can't remember, I'm looking at to see what other question was associated to that. No, I think you got it. Okay. You got it. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Well, everyone, I think that's all we have time for in terms of questions. Um, if there were any other questions that didn't get answered, we will follow up afterwards. Um, we do have a copy of them. I do want to point out as well, I forgot to, we forgot to mention at the beginning that in the handout section under the control on the control panel, there is a copy of the webinar slides if you would like them. 
Um, but now I'm going to pass it back to Stephanie. Yeah, thanks everyone. Hey, this is Stephanie on behalf of the National School Garden Network again. Um, thanks to all of our presenters today um, and for sharing your models, your challenges, your best practices, um, and what's happening with your school garden support organization. You guys did a fabulous job. And thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, as like Tristana said, the handout is available. We'll keep the webinar live for just a minute if you need to quickly grab that. In addition, um, just a reminder that we have our forum here please use that. Also, um, we'll be emailing out a copy of this webinar so you guys can reference it. It will also be archived on the National School Garden Network um, webpage as well, if in a year or two years you wanna come back and look at that. So thanks again, everyone, for attending, and um, have a great rest of your week.